Okay, financial statements part three. This would end up being financial accounting, understanding the last part of the financial statements. This is right before you get into the nuts and bolts of doing the actual recording of different transactions and so forth that would occur in a business, like a sale and so forth, and how you'd actually record it. Once you've recorded all those, that's what creates the financial statements. So we're doing the financial statements first, the end product, because that's what most people look at. Then we're going to lead into how to get there to the end product. But you need to understand what you're trying to get to before you actually do it. It's like the point is you don't start saying, okay, how do you build a car? You got to know what a car is and what it's supposed to look like before you start. So that's why I'm doing the financial statements first. And this is the third part before we start breaking everything down. Again, you start with the heading, company name, Pete's Garage, statement of cash flow, indirect method. There's two methods. There's the direct method and indirect method. The controlling board that determines this, which we'll talk about at a different time, but Securities Exchange Commission is one example, and FASB, without getting into the Financial Accounting Standards Board, rules that you follow, general accepted accounting principles. There's a lot of rules that, we, that makes all this up. But there's two methods. It's said that the preferred method is to do the direct method. I don't know of anyone that does a direct method. Because that means every transaction you have to keep track of every cash event, which you logically will unrecord it, but that means you have to then go and look at each one of them and break them down by categories. Was this an operating activity, an investing activity, or financing activity? Keep it by category at the end. If you have a good software programmer, if you remember the last two parts I did, you come up with a balance sheet. If you look at beginning and ending numbers for the different accounts, there you should already know which is it an operating, investing, or financing activity of that part of the balance sheet. Look at the change in the number, see if it went up or down. Apply a simple rule, and boom, you have the number. And you're only looking at two numbers for every account instead of every single transaction in every account. And think of an in and out, how many cash transactions, and that's just sales. And then you have the inventory and all that. Versus just looking at the ending finished number and press a button and boom, you have your cash flow. Much easier. That's when everyone does. I have never heard of anyone doing the direct method. Just so you know, so I'll explain the indirect. The direct is just simply following the cash and putting the category. So it's pretty much already explained once we go through this. You start with operating activities. That just means what you do for a business. What are your normal operations? Do you mow lawns, your lawn mowing business? Do you sell cars because you're a car dealership? Uh, do you produce machines? You're a manufacturing and you actually make equipment or machines. Whereas if you get a machine, buy a machine, then you'd have to ask, okay, is this inventory or is this something I'm selling? And this is why that becomes important. Operating is what you do for a living. Investing is investing in yourself or in someone else. That would be like buying stock in someone else. Investing in the stock market idea. Investing in yourself, meaning your own business, that'd be along the lines of buying, say, property planner equipment, land building equipment. You're investing in yourself. And that's to help your business grow versus that's not the same as buying inventory because that's going to sell, that's normal operations. Then there's financing activities. And financing is pretty simple. There's two items that are financing. The first way to finance would end up being bring on another owner, meaning let's sell some stock. Now they're technically an owner. Or bring on a partner. That's one way. The other way is to borrow money, obtain financing, uh, student loan for instance. So that would be financing activity. And the cash coming in is positive, cash going out is negative for all of these. But what we do is we actually go, and once we start with the operating, that's the only unique one. It starts by saying, take net income. That's, that's from the income statement, not the balance sheet. You take your net income, and then also from the income statement, add back depreciation. I can tell you why. On the income statement, depreciation is just an accounting entry saying, keep track of, say, like you drive so many miles in your car, and you know that after a car gets a ton of miles on it, they start to break down because of wear and tear, you need to put money aside to be able to fix the car as it gets older. When they're brand new, they normally have a warranty and they rarely break down. 
that's the concept of depreciation. There's no money putting aside, it's telling you you should. And since there's not a monetary entry, and we talk about net income, and I'll tell you, net income is not really necessarily cash because you can make a sale on credit and it's still a sale, so there's a difference between a cash method and a cruel method, but we'll address that later. Because you can do everything where you only deal with cash, but you can also do things where you deal with a cruel, it's called a cruel method. And we'll talk about that later. It's just letting you know that technically, net income on the income statement is not exactly necessarily dollar for dollar that would be in your bank account. But we'll address that later. We're getting into the breakdown. So operating activities, you have net income plus depreciation, you add it back, which now says, okay, let's now look at all the accounts on the balance sheet. Now on the balance sheet, you don't look at any subtotals or totals, you're looking at account names, and you actually only look at cash balance at the very end. So what you're looking at then is going to every account name and seeing if it's operating, if it's something you do for your normal activity. Like an account receivable, for instance, that's a sale on credit we talked about just a minute or two ago. A sale on credit, that, oh, actually I should say that was in part two. And what that means is you're actually, you, say you go and buy something from a company or go to Pete's Garage, it's a rough sports bar, and you decide to go there on Tuesdays when they have their wing deal where they have them on sale. You could buy that with cash or you could give them a credit card, and let's say Pete's Grad had their own credit card, I don't know if they do or not, but let's say they did, that would then be an account receivable to them, you'd have an account payable, you'd owe them, they have the right to receive the money in the future. So you'd put account receivable, and since you did it on credit, they have an increase in account receivable, so they'd have an account receivable put an arrow up, or increase in account receivable. And they list that for all the different accounts. They'd be operating, you'd do the same thing for investing and financing, which I just told you. So you're just getting subtotals for the three categories. And you make the list. There's very normally very few in investing and very few in financing. Almost everything's operating, but you'll get a few. Once you've done that and you'll have a number here, I say make sure they're all positive numbers. No negative is just the difference from beginning to ending a year, and you don't care if it if it comes up minus in your calculator. If it's minus, you just put an arrow down or decrease and put the account name. Once you finish that and you have all the numbers there, then apply the rule. This pretty much here, this is a rule that you follow to know if you have pluses or minuses in the end. They're all currently pluses, but let's say it's account receivable. Account receivable is an asset, and if account receivable goes down, we just said it went up, but let's say it went down. The reason if I'm a company and my account receivable goes down is because someone paid me, so I got cash. So if, they, if it goes down, you get a positive. If it goes up, it's just the opposite, negative. And since these are liability and equity, we learned are the opposite side of the accounting equation, the balance sheet, it's on the opposite side. What you do then is the same thing, the arrow up, that has to be the opposite. Minus, plus, plus, minus. You've now covered assets, liabilities, and equity. You've covered the financial statement of the balance sheet, which means you can now prepare this and then you would add in any of them that have the increase asset or decrease in from beginning to end of the year for liabilities or equity. You put a minus, so you have the proper ones in, you total them, add, and if there's any minus, subtract that. You get three totals. That would be the net cash either provided inflow or outflow of cash from all three activities, that would be the number that we're saying that's right here. Then you add your beginning cash, January 1's cash balance that you had when you started the year. When you add that to it, that'll give you an ending number, that should be your ending cash, and if you look at the balance sheet, that number should match and be the ending number on the balance sheet, and if it is, you did it right, you done, you learned it, you're good to go. Thank you.